take this opportunity to introduce Amreen. I know I'm standing between you and some amazing programming, but um, I would like to introduce Amreen, who will be our moderator and is actually my co-leader for Open Boston. So in addition to being the chairperson for Open Boston, Amreen Mirza is a strategic thinker and skilled negotiator with a track record of designing and scaling programs, building partnerships and creating legacies. She's an educator, public speaker, editor, writer, an entrepreneur with a keen interest in the environment, social enterprise, and public policy. Her work supporting natural disaster programs from hurricanes in Texas to earthquakes and floods in Haiti and South Asia earned her the 2019 Green Initiative Leadership Award at the Green Business Breakfast organized by Boston Green Fest, New England's largest environmental festival. Umbrian has long championed social entrepreneurship as a method to address systemic problems in society. She's taught undergraduate, graduate, and executive business level courses on entrepreneurship, corporate citizenship, civic engagement, and business ethics, including innovative social enterprises for the Tisch College of Civic Life and Entrepreneurship Center at Tufts University. She has authored articles on private equity investment in real estate, healthcare, energy, and infrastructure in Manasa region for the Economist Intelligence Unit and was lead analyst and editor for the Innovation in Government Services Benchmarking Report published for the Shaping Government Services Summit held in Dubai. The study profiled key government innovations in healthcare, education, and social services sectors across urban and rural populations. Her community engagement endeavors include advising various NGOs and social enterprises. She's currently secretary of Open Global and chairperson of Open Boston. Umbreen holds an MA in international public policy from Paul H. Nitz School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University and a BA in international relations and history from Tufts University. So with that, I'd like to pass the baton to Ambreen. Thanks. Thank you so much for, for that introduction, Fariha. Um, wanted to, uh, first of all, welcome Nahid Badalia, um, Dr. Nahid Badalia, who is our uh, infectious diseases physician at the and medical director of special pathogens unit at Boston Medical Center, um, which is a medical unit designed to care for patients with highly communicable diseases. She has experience with direct patient care, outbreak response, and medical countermeasures research during multiple Ebola virus disease outbreaks in West and East Africa. Um, she is also a special, she's a news contributor to MSNBC. She teaches as an associate professor in the section of infectious diseases at Boston University School of Medicine. And there she oversees the medical response program for BU's maximum uh, containment biosafety level four program at National Emerging Infectious Diseases Laboratory, uh, Laboratories. She also uh, is an associate professor at the Institute of Human Security at the Tufts Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, where she teaches a course on human security uh, and emerging infectious diseases. She graduated from Tufts University, both, she obtained both her BA and her MD from Tufts. And she also has a master's in law and diplomacy from the Fletcher School. Um, so please welcome Dr. Bedelia, who will talk about vaccines, variants, and the return to normalcy. Thanks so much, Amreen. I am gonna share my PowerPoint. Uh, it was a incredibly um, gracious introduction, but I, I will I will sort of explain what I do on a day to day and, and how it relates to how we're combating uh, the outbreak. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about vaccines variants and the return to normalcy. And I, I um, wanna pause and, and say that at the end of the section, I, I wanna make sure I leave a lot of room for questions because you know one of the things that we've figured out is that because science is, is moving so fast during this pandemic, um, there's generally confusion because it feels like the minute you understand a new concept, the, the, the landscape seems to have sh shifted altogether. 
So what I do is actually just that on an everyday basis. I work for, as, as Ambreen said, a biosafety level four laboratory that deals with um, highly communicable diseases, majority of which are viral hemorrhagic fevers. And um, we have a lab that uh, at Boston University and I run the medical response to that, as you can see with the, the type of drills that you see up there, as well as a large program of over 150 healthcare workers. Um, they're prepared if, if there's ever a threat in the Boston area um, to activate and take care of these patients. And I'd previously uh, been part of um, outbreaks, as Ambreen mentioned, and, and just no disclosures here. But what that really means is that we build um, infrastructure and programs here and internationally on, on keeping healthcare workers safe, on how to provide the best care possible for, uh, for patients who are coming in with these diseases because with emerging infectious diseases, we're learning about them as we're providing care and, and, and hence research and, and clinical care are also tied together. Um, and so we deal with this tension all the time of how do you deal with evolving scientific uh, knowledge and how do you adopt it with the best possible um, both uh, you know, uh, care for patients as well as ethics when it comes to research. So um, a lot of teams you know, to deal with across the world. We currently have a program in Uganda. Um, I'm the clinical lead of a program at the border of DRC and, and we're of course dealing with a, a, a new, a, another uh, Ebola outbreak in DRC that's currently happening. And I've previously worked in West Africa, in Liberia and Sierra Leone. Um, so I wanna start with this. Um, so this is a animation from Johns Hopkins that really talks about the path of how we got here. And, and you know, beginning, what we now know is this virus, SARS-CoV-2, which causes COVID-19, was probably circulating in, in our community since the beginning of January. And over the course of March, as we um, first started to realize that this was happening, end of February, beginning of March is when we realized that there was um, community transmission, the disease was everywhere. And, and, and at that point, the public health measures, uh, they would have worked, which is, you know, having just some communities through a lockdown wouldn't have worked. And hence, we went into a national lockdown for a couple of weeks. And then since then, we've been in this, you know, seesaw, we've, we've basically been having peaks and, and, and then coming down from those peaks of cases and hospitalizations and deaths only to open up again, um, and then repeat the, repeat the, the, the path one more time. The difference this time is that we have vaccines and in record time, you know, incredible um, amount of prior research went into creating uh, what seemed to be at least five, you know, major candidates that are approved, three of which are approved here in the United States. And I'm gonna go into them in a little bit of detail and two more that might be actually coming down the pike, but all of those, you know, so the way that we got these vaccines is that there was something called Operation Warp Speed, which uh, is really an investment on the side of the government to take on sunken costs. There were technologies, you know, the few things that we had in our favor was very early in this pandemic. To create a vaccine, you need to figure out uh, what part of the virus you wanna target. And we lucked out because beginning of January, China shared the genetic sequence of this new pathogen that was sort of threatening us uh, publicly. And all the countries were, about to, uh, were able to take that sequence and start working on both diagnostics as well as vaccines. And really within the first 60 days, we were able to take that sequence and, and put the first dose of the Moderna, what is now the Moderna vaccine in the first human trials, which is incredible. Um, but, but that belies what went before that, right? It was about 40 years of research in messenger RNA technology and about 10 years of really perfecting it uh, to the point where we got to that. And not only that, but we built on data from the other SARS um, coronavirus and coronavirus pandemic. So from the original SARS uh, pandemic that occurred in 2002, 2003, we knew what part of this virus to target. So we lucked out there as well because there was a lot of research existing on that part. And we knew from MERS-CoV-2, which is another virus of the same family, again, that this is pretty consistent. In this class of viruses, that's what you have to aim for. So at the end of this, you know, where we stand now is one year in, um, we were able to do extensive clinical trials, you know, 40,000 people on average, 40,000 in, in Johnson and Saint Johnson, 40,000 in the Pfizer, Pfizer trial, about 30,000 in Moderna um, that went through a traditional phase through trial, phase three trial that would have 
um, generally it would have taken years to get to a phase three trial. And the, the, the reason they got to a phase three trial is because of the investment that was made by the government um, to allow the companies to move on to more advanced trials. It wasn't that the trials themselves are shortened. It was that there was sunken cost that was put to sort of make sure that we get these in record time. And there's now data that the, the, the efficacy that we've seen you know, in trials and in, in many cases um, actually carries out. Even once this, 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 these vaccines have now been distributed both here and abroad, their effectiveness, real life effectiveness seems to mirror a lot of what we're seeing in trials. So what did we see in trials? I wanna go through the three, the three major, um, the, the major vaccines that we have on market right now, because I know there are a lot of questions about how they're, how they're built, you know, what they do, um, and then talk a little bit about how they're different. Um, so the first two vaccines that were approved were the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine, and they're both very similar in their technology. They're messenger RNA vaccines, and I'll talk a little bit about what that means in a second. In those trials, what they looked for, where they would look for everybody who had any symptoms, they gave half the people the vaccine, the other half they didn't give the vaccine, and they allowed them to sort of carry on with their lives. Then they compared how much reduction in disease there was between the people who got the vaccine versus the people who didn't get the vaccine. So they were looking for anybody who had symptomatic disease, and there was a 95% decrease or 94% decrease in, in case of Moderna um, in, in terms of any symptomatic disease. And it was 100% reduction in, in hospitalization as well as, as death. And that's really you know, what we're worried about. We're over 500 of our fellow Americans have passed away. You know, globally, we're, we're nearing 2 million, uh, 2 and a half million you know, of people who may, have been, may, may be dying from this soon. And so the fact that we have this 95% reduction in death and hospitalization, that really is a number we're looking for because that's what overwhelms our healthcare systems. It's what you know, makes us lose our, health, our loved ones. The second vaccine, the third vaccine rather, that's now recently approved is something called the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. There's a difference, and I'll talk about a little bit, uh, there's, a, there's difference in the technology of this vaccine and it's more traditional technology. It uses a, um, a, a inactivated cold virus. I'll talk about it in a second. What they did in that trial, that trial was carry out, carried on a little bit later timeline-wise. It was carried out once we had at least three or three of those you know, variants that we've you've been hearing about of concern circulating. The, the trial was held in the UK, in South Africa, and in Brazil, and in the US. In that trial, they weren't looking for all people with symptoms. They were looking only to see moderate to severe disease as well as severe disease and hospitalizations and deaths. So their outcomes are different. So when you see that number efficacy, you know, you just pay attention to that partly because it's just talking about a different type of efficacy, it's efficacy against severe, moderate to severe disease. And what we know is that overall in the US against moderate to severe diseases, it was 72% effective and against severe disease, about 85% effective against hospitalization death and deaths. 100% effective. So, you know, we'll talk about why there's, this has raised some questions because it causes confusion of like, why would I take one over the other? Um, and I'll talk about that in a second. But they were looking at different things and not only that, but they were looking at it at different times and that makes a difference. What you might see coming down the pike are two other candidates. One is AstraZeneca vaccine, again, um, that's, you know, been approved in the UK. Um, there, there's a US trial that's ongoing and we'll find out a bit more data on that. And there's a Novavax candidate that might be coming. And so in the next month and a half, you'll be hearing about these two vaccines, but I won't go into them into a lot of detail. So there's a lot of concern about the messenger RNA vaccine because you've heard that this is new technology. And, and you know, when people hear you know, RNA and genetics, there's a question of what exactly is it that these vaccines are, are doing. And I, I and this is a very complicated figure, but I'm gonna walk you through only one part of this, so bear with me. You see at the very top where it says mRNA vaccine, the second to the left, at the very top, second to the left graphic, that round circle with the squiggly lines in the middle, that's what an, a messenger RNA vaccine is. It's all it is, it's a lipid coat with a stabilized molecule, which is a messenger RNA. So an RNA is an instruction molecule that your cells use to produce protein. It does not merge into your own gen genetic material. It just goes into the part of your cell. So it merges with your cell, goes in the part of your cell, it uses the machinery to create the protein of interest. And the instructions, right, that are being given to your body is to create the protein that's part of the virus. So here's how the virus works. The virus has something called a spike protein, um, and, and, and part of its that's the part of the virus that it uses to attach to human cells and interhuman cells 
and replicate and cause the infection and symptoms and the damage that we're seeing. And so what you're doing here is the best way I've heard it described is you, it's an email to your immune system. And when you open the email, you see this picture and, and the picture is to give you instructions to recognize what the enemy looks like, which is the spike protein that the virus is, is looking at um, using to enter your body. And so your body produces that spike protein and then other cells, immune cells recognize it and say, ha, huh, I now know what the immune memory needs to be when I see this again. And, and that's, that's sort of the, the, the technology, right? Messenger RNAs do not stick around in your body. They are molecules that disintegrate within hours. And so once you've been given this memory, all that lasts is the memory and not the material that, that went in. Um, so the reason this is very exciting technology is because it's really highly adaptable. It's easy and you know, fast to produce. And it's gonna be helpful, not just in coronavirus, but actually in a lot of other infectious diseases moving forward. And, you know, in fact, I think there is now a candidate for malaria um, that's been looked at, you know, which is another disease that causes immense amount of deaths around the world. There's disadvantages, you know, initially we didn't have as much clinical safety data, but thankfully with the trials that we've had so far, they have been shown to be very safe, you know, um, and I'll talk a little bit about the safety of vaccines in a second as well as opposed to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And so that's a little bit more traditional technology that uses a, another harmless cold virus. And all it does is it puts the instructions for the spike protein in that cold virus is genetic, that you, you get the vaccine, you are, you will sort of create, again, replicate those spike proteins and your body again builds the immunity. So there are already existing candidates of adenovirus vaccine. So that's what this Johnson & Johnson vaccine is. It's a one dose vaccine that uses another inactivated, you know, the, the uh, virus that can basically give your immune system um, the memory about the spike protein. So why is it hard to compare, right? You're seeing all these numbers, 95, 85, 72, 100. So what does this mean? I think the reason it's important to understand is that I'll talk about the variants, but um, the trials were done at different times. So when, when the Pfizer and Moderna trials were done, they were done at a time where there were not the three, vac three variants that we're concerned about, the B117, the B1351, and the P1. All of those variants I'll talk about in, in the next slide have been shown, there's concern that they may be more transmissible, they may affect the vaccine efficacy. And in fact, what they found was that they do in fact for, for the, the clinical trials that were done during the period of time where, where, where those variants, particularly the, 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 it, the variant that was found in the U, sorry, in, in South Africa and Brazil, uh, where, and where be predominant, it reduced the efficacy of the vaccine. So we don't know what would have happened had Pfizer and Moderna repeated their trials around the time when those variants were more predominant. The other reason is because they were looking at different things, right? They were not looking at all infections. Johnson Johnson was looking at moderate and severe. So people always ask me, and in fact, my sister did this yesterday um, because in a month, you know, she may qualify and she said, which one should I pick? And, and I said, the best vaccine, and I give the same advice to everybody who asks me is the one that you can get today because currently the, the difference is not between um, Pfizer and Moderna, it is between having a vaccine versus not having a vaccine. And, and, and any day that you spend without protection right now, while all of us are, a lot of us are still you know, lacking immunity against this disease, um, the vaccine that you can get is the one that you should get because they all protect against the things that we care about, which is hospitalizations and deaths. And they also reduce severe disease, right? 85% reduction in severe disease. Not only that, but the other reason to just get whatever vaccine you qualify for today is that eventually it looks like we're gonna to have to modify the vaccines anyway. What we've heard from Moderna and Pfizer, and, and also this is true of Johnson & Johnson, is that they're working on boosters that will affect, that will work particularly on the variants. And so regardless of what you take today, what we're seeing down the pike is in about six months or a year, there might be another booster that we may have to take um, regardless. So not only that, but the other way to put this into some context is um, think about it this way, compared to the flu vaccine, right? The vaccine effectiveness of flu is 44% and we still take it. And the reason we take it is again, taking the flu vaccine helps us avoid hospitalizations and deaths, particularly around, uh, among vulnerable people. Um, the Corona, the AstraZeneca vaccine is about 70%. You know, I won't talk about it a little bit, but look at the other vaccines that are out there. Chickenpox is 92%. Right, and, and even though the numbers for Moderna and Pfizer say 94 and 95%, I want you to take that with a grain of salt because um, in the laboratory, what we know is that um, 
that there might be some impact on the efficacy of vaccines. So if, if they had done the trials over again today, those numbers may be different. It looks like they would still have protected 100% against deaths and, and hospitalizations, but it may have affected that 94 number in my, in my perspective. So the question that comes up that's important, right? This is tied into how do we return to normal? Well, it makes a difference because we're now entering this question of can vaccines reduce transmission is important because we're now entering a period of the pandemic where some of us are vaccinated and others are not vaccinated. And those of us who are vaccinated are trying to figure out how much of a threat we pose, what we can do, how our life changes, right? And what we all wanna do is to ensure that we are able to do the things that we love, but, but that we don't pose a continued risk to others in our community who haven't yet been vaccinated. Um, so what is the data currently on whether or not vaccines reduce transmission? So we have trial data. So AstraZeneca's trial, Moderna's trial, and Johnson Johnson's trial had a much smaller sub-trial within their, within their design where they look to test people right before their second dose, right? Um, to see how many of them, or and, and then it, how many of them actually had a breakthrough infection. So what do I mean by that? What we know is that most vaccines, all vaccines help reduce disease, right? This is why, that's why we have the vaccine. But most vaccines also have an impact on transmission, which means that you can, if you get the vaccine, if you get exposed to the virus again, you might end up getting the infection, but your body has this immense immune response. And so the virus is not able to replicate in your airway. So it may still replicate a little bit. Um, and so you end up getting the infection, but you don't get the disease. However, if you're getting the infection and you're replicating some of that virus in your airway, are you posing a threat to others around you if you get infected and you're not aware and can you transmit it to other people? So what's the data around that? So the first part of that is that we know from trials in small numbers that it looks like people who've been vaccinated, even if they get the infection, um, the um, number of people who get the infection is lower, about two thirds of the people in trials, a reduction of asymptomatic infection, that's wonderful. The other thing that we know is data from Israel that shows that people who are vaccinated, there's a study that came out that basically showed that even if, you, if you've been vaccinated, if you get the infection, the amount of virus in your airways tends to be small amounts. So, it, so the next question though is, you know, is that still enough to infect other people? And, and that's a question that we don't know much about. So long story short, the answer is yes, it looks like these vaccines will reduce transmission. We don't know by how much. And that's really right, the question that we wanna ask in terms of whether we go back to normal or not. So I wanna take this to, to answer, I put this as a reminder my, to myself because I get these vaccine myth questions all the time. And I wanna make sure I answer a couple and then leave some room for you to ask me any, any questions that you've heard about the vaccines. So first and foremost, I've heard a lot of myths about um, the fact that mRNA vaccines will alter your genetic code. Absolutely not. As I mentioned, these are just messenger RNAs are just molecules that are instructions to create a protein and they vanish within a matter of hours. They have nothing to do with your genetics. They do not merge with your genetic system. It is then, and not only that, but they are, they've been found from all these trials and not only that, the data coming out from millions of people since they've received emergency use authorizations that they are, rel they're pretty safe, right? The data that came out from trials was no severe adverse effects except for uh, very rare anaphylactic shock anaphylactic, rather anaphylactic reactions. And then the data from millions of Americans who've gotten it so far, the CDC released a report about a week and a half ago that said that the, that reaction, the anaphylaxis reaction is about 4.5 in a in million people who get it. So very rare. In most cases, the side effects are on the first dose, when you get it, you have sort of injection site soreness, you have some muscle aches, you may have a low grade fever or for a day or two, some headaches. Um, and then the Pfizer are sort of very similar. And in the second dose, you might have a slightly more severe version of that. So my advice for, pe for people is that when you get the vaccine, a um, couple of hours afterwards, if you start developing the symptoms, take a Tylenol and that should help control your symptoms. Um, but, the, but in terms of data and, and the myths that are out there about vaccines causing deaths, Absolutely not. That number that the the report that I talked about from CDC evaluated um, deaths that were that so they looked at everybody who'd received a vaccine and they looked at people who died right and there was no correlation between people who got the vaccine um, and people who who ended up dying. So the cause of death was not temporarily related to the vaccines and it was not related by mechanism and and so no the myth out there the vaccine is killing people absolutely not true. 
The other myth that I hear is, is the issue with pregnancy and whether taking the vaccine affects you know, pregnant women um, or affects their children or affects your ability to reproduce. Also, you know, everything that we know so far, so there is still data that needs to come out, but everything we know so far from animal data that was done on these, on these vaccine um, candidates, um, no effect on, on pregnancy. In trial data for all the pregnant women who were involved, and granted there were small numbers in trials, um, no, no effect on um, changing, sort of no effect on um, the severity of sort of, of any kind of pregnancy related complications and no effect on the fetus. Um, then they have data now from the millions, you know, the millions of vaccines that we have out, out there now, thousands of pregnant women have now received this vaccine. Um, and CDC's report, that same safety report that I mentioned, mentions that no pregnant women have seen any sort of child-related, uh, embryo-related sort of uh, complications or complications of pregnancy uh, from these vaccines. So what my advice would be is that if you're pregnant or thinking about getting pregnant, that you should um, talk to your uh, OBGYN, and, and this is a decision based on your risk factors and anything else, you know, in terms of your medical history. Um, but if I were, my personal advice is if I were pregnant today, and if someone is asking me about whether I would take the vaccine or not, given the current data, I would probably take it, but that's my individual case. Um, there are other myths, but I want to stop there so that I can sort of finish on time and, and give you some time to ask questions. I want to point this out, and I think he, this is new data, and so you may not be hearing this yet, but something amazing is happening. You know, as we're vaccinating people, millions of doses of this vaccine, right, are out there now, and, and we've really increased the rate at how we're vaccinating. Over 2 million people are getting vaccinated a day over the last week, which is incredible. And in the short period of time since December, we've vaccinated 50% of the people who are over 65. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point out why that's important. People of every age and people with every medical comorbidity or condition can get hospitalized and sick, but the most amount of deaths seem to come from people who are over 65. Most amount of hospitalizations seem to come from old people who are over 65. So when we vaccinate that group, what we want to see is that there is an improvement in that, right? We want to see the improvement in hospitalization, overall hospitalization and death numbers. And we've seen exactly that. You know, we've done about 50% of people over 65, and I think it's over 60% of the people over 75. And the mortality in our nursing homes since then has dropped by 66%. And I'll show you a graph on this. And then we have data from other countries. And I bring up Israel again, partly because they're the farthest ahead in any country in the world in, replic in vaccinating majority of their population. And so they've vaccinated 80% of over 60 year olds um, and they've vaccinated about 40% of those under 60 um, that, that have at least gotten one dose or not. So here's the US data that I was talking about. Look at that drastic drop in people. The bottom line is nursing home residents and their vaccination started in December. Look at their death rates, right? It's just, it's dropped 66%. And compare that to people who are not in the nursing home who did not get these vaccines. And you're actually, when you saw the spike go up from holiday travels, unfortunately, death, their death rates actually went up as well. Let me see if I, okay, here we go. So this is the one of the graphs from new hospitalizations from Israel. So look at this over 60 year olds, right? That's, that's who they've vaccinated. 80% of their over 60 year olds have vaccinated. Before they started vaccinated, the blue line, you can see the difference. Everybody who is over 65, uh, 60 years of age was contributing a lot to the hospitalizations, right? The minute they started hospitalizing, uh, vaccinating, the hospitalizations went down. And now you're almost seeing more hospitalizations in people who are younger uh, because they've not yet you know, gotten through everybody yet, even though that number is coming down as well. And the same thing with deaths. And that's what we want to see in all of our communities here in the US, we wanna see um, those numbers. We wanna see deaths go down. And so when, when do we think that's going to happen? I, I personally, I think that over the, the more people we get vaccinated over the next two or three months, the better chances are that we'll start seeing a drop in hospitalizations, drastic drops in hospitalizations and deaths. Um, and that's the first sign of normalcy we'll see, right? Because part of what made this time abnormal was how overwhelmed our healthcare systems were. Um, and seeing that is gonna be the first step we take into, into going back to normal. But here's what sort of threatens it. It's the variants. So what are variants? All viruses mutate. So uh, RNA viruses, which is what the coronaviruses are, uh, also every time they replicate, every time they make a copy of themselves, right? They're not perfect at making a copy. So they might make a mistake and that's a mutation. 
every once in a while, a mutation comes along that's actually really advantageous to the virus. And it may, it may help it survive longer, right? It may help it transmit more and, and replicate itself more. Uh, and so those, are, those types of mutations offer what we call uh, a natural selection advantage, right? And, and they end up, being, um, end up being more predominant because that's what, that's what survives, right, in, in natural selection. Um, so the three variants that we're worried about, the ones that we've identified and, and the mutations that are part of these variants are found over and over again in actually many homegrown variants we're seeing here in the US. There are variants in California, there are variants in New York, there's another variant that you know that's discovered on the West Coast. You're, we're seeing the virus adopt these variants partly because this is of advantage to them. And it's not that the there's one monolithic you know, virus that sort of replicates. It's just that many of these viruses are coming by these same mutations and holding on to those mutations because it's of advantage to them. Um, so the B, the three variants that I want to go through are the B117, which was first discovered in the UK, and that's what's um, growing by leaps and bounds in the US. Over 48 states have you know, re reported having B117. And here in Boston, we at the National Emerging Infectious Diseases Labs have been doing sequencing of all the samples that we're getting um, from the Boston University community because we're testing all, all our students, and professors, and staff. And two weeks ago, when we did that, 5% of our samples were B117. This week, when we did that again, 26% of our samples are now B117. So what we're seeing here is very similar to what we're seeing other countries where B117 was become predominant, which is that all of a sudden it takes over as the predominant variant. And it's worrisome because what we know about B117 is that it's more transmissible. It seems to, when you get infected with this version of the virus, you get more virus in your airway and it lasts for longer. And that allows you to transmit it to other people with greater ease and it, it makes it easier for other people to get infected. And that's why it's concerning because in every country where B117 has become predominant within a few weeks, it, the cases shoot up for that reason. We also don't know, there's some concern that this variant may have increased mortality, it may have increased lethality, but it hasn't been sorted out yet. Um, we, we, we currently think that it may cause increased severity, but um, again, a lot of this is sort of still science that's being, that's being worked on. The good news though, is that it doesn't seem to affect um, the vaccines as much. In the trials from Novavax, from Johnson & Johnson, the B117 clinically did not seem to affect the, the, the impact of the available vaccines. In laboratory, it not, did not seem to affect the, uh, the efficacy of the Moderna or Pfizer vaccine either. It also did not seem to have an effect on our therapies, monoclonal antibodies, which are an immune therapy that we're using um, to treat some patients who are high risk. Um, it does not seem to significantly affect those. Um, and it does not seem to affect the chance of reinfection. So if you've had an infection from before, if you, can you get infected with this variant? It seems less likely. Uh, but it, there, it does seem to have some impact on our diagnostics. And so, you know, there have been new technologies that have been integrated to make sure that our diagnostics pick up B117. The next one is B1351, which is first discovered in South Africa. And again, here too, there's a, there's a concern that it increases transmissibility, um, but we don't know yet about its you know, ability to cause more severity or higher mortality yet. But the concerning thing is that even if they, it may not impact the kind of disease that you get, it impacts your ability to survive it because it does have an impact on the vaccines and it has an impact on our immune therapies. What we've seen from the clinical trials from Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca, as well as the lab data from Moderna and Pfizer, is that this seems to decrease the efficacy. In Johnson & Johnson, for example, the trial, the overall efficacy was 72% in the US, where there's the wild type variant in South Africa, um, it went down to about 60 something percent uh, because, because the B1351 is very predominant there. Um, and same thing with Johnson & Johnson, they've seen, uh, sorry, same thing with Novavax, they saw a reduction in that. So this is concerning because um, what we know though is that the it still means you should get the vaccine, and here's why. What we know is that you know when you get the vaccine, you get this huge, you know, levels of uh, antibodies that help you help protect you. And what these variants do is seem to be a little bit better at overcoming these antibodies. But because the vaccines produce so much amount of antibodies, they are not enough to overcome um, the the immune system completely. And hence the the thought is, and and what we know from clinical trials is that 
but the vaccines still protect you despite the variants, you know, the vaccines still protect you against hospitalization, severe disease and death. But of course, every human being is different, right? I mean, it depends on your own immune system's ability to, to tackle that. But my advice would be in the face of the variants, it makes it even more important that we get the vaccines because this is how we stop the, the virus from replicating. You know, the less people that it, it infects, the less people it's able to make sicker for longer, the less likely it is for the virus to be transmitted. Um, and, and, and the other concern here is that um, if you've had the infection before, the natural infection before, there are greater reports of reinfection with this variant. So you may still get infected with the one B1351. And the same thing with the next variant, the P1 variant that was discovered in Brazil and Japan, very similar to the, what we're seeing in B1351. Um, it's under investigation whether there is impact on vaccines, but it looks like it might because it has some of the same mutations and it does impact our immune therapies. Um, and, and so far, neither one of those last two impact the diagnostics, but in both of those cases, the data from Brazil is really concerning. The P1, um, you know, they, as you may, may, may remember, Brazil picked a strategy where they just let everybody get infected. They said, you know, let's just see if we're going to achieve herd immunity. Well, when they looked at studies, you know, in huge portions, sections of their population, they got up to 70, 75 percent of the people having out of uh, rather having antibodies. So they had evidence of prior infection. And even then they're seeing reinfections, which means that P1, the variant can cause reinfections, even if you've had prior infection before. So we have some um, we have some sort of, you know, now that we have the vaccines, the good news here is that we found from the Biden administration that there'll be enough of these vaccines candidates, and I think even more so because I think it's likely that AstraZeneca and Novavax may be approved in the next month and a half or so, depending on what the data looks like when it comes out from U.S. trials. The big thing is going to be getting all these doses, right? Manufacturing seems like we are solving that problem but it's getting it to where they need to be in an equitable fa uh, manner. And then um, actually convincing people to take the vaccine, right? You've seen, look at Israel's data, look at the impact it's having on hospitalizations and deaths. If we can, if we can get these vaccines into people, we can improve our population immunity and we can keep these variants from, from growing. So what's our path back to normalcy? And I'll end, um, end there in a couple of minutes. Well, it's unclear, right? So we have these vaccines. It's unclear what new variants will show up. And the longer high amounts of infections are happening in our community, the, the higher the chances that new variants will evolve. Because why do variants evolve? Variants evolve because viruses are replicating uncontrolled. And every time they replicate, they have another lottery ticket, right, to, to potentially try on a new mutation. And so if we can keep our transmission down until more of us are vaccinated, then we're less likely to worry about these variants. But we don't know what's on the horizon. The good news is we now have the technology and we now have a track record of safety. So it shouldn't be like starting over from square one. What FDA has done is pass guidance that says that vaccine manufacturers should be able to change their vaccines around to address the variants without having to go through the phase three, phase three trials, which is what we do currently with the flu vaccine. So it's very similar to what, what the, the annual flu vaccine strategy is as well. And so it won't take us as long, but it's, it's better for us not to wait to have these new variants appear. The other question is how quickly will we achieve herd immunity? So big question here is, you know, how many of us are already infected? Um, there's a Columbia study that says that likely about 100 million Americans have already had the infection. Now, the concern, though, is even if you've been infected, you could still be vulnerable to these new variants. And so it's not a perfect um, you know, equation that everybody who's, who's had a, 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 an infection before could be counted in this herd immunity component. There's numbers being thrown around, you know, now that there are more vaccines, maybe we'll reach herd immunity by the summer, or maybe we'll reach herd immunity by fall. I think it depends on how many people take the vaccine. And I think it depends on how frequent reinfections are with these variants. Um, and so it, it's looking like a better picture than I would have said even in December, right? Because we have more of these doses. And, and uh, But I think that those that's one of the unknowns. What will the new normal look like? So if you look at the historical data from 1918 influenza, right after that ended, um, people are under similar to what we're doing now, you know, limiting social interactions. As soon as that was over, you had the roaring 20s. You know, people, um, what I'm likely to see is a lot of us having davits and, you know, and having, and having gatherings and, and bringing family together. And that's likely to happen because we've been kept so far apart. And so you might return, you might have a period of time where people are just happy to see each other, you know, when we go back to this normal and, and likely path and take this as my opinion only, 
and you'll hear others, it's likely that by summer we'll be able to start if a majority of us are vaccinated, particularly in our communities, that we'll be able to go back to having small gatherings without masks within our within our communities. The thing that makes it difficult is, you know, what will the variants do? We don't know. Um, I predict that by next winter, as, Dr., as President Biden has said, we'll go back to some amount of normalcy where we can have larger gatherings. Uh, the one thing that I do hope happens is that we are able to take some of the good lessons from this pandemic, right? Remember when we used to go in you know, to work sick? I hope we don't do that anymore, right? I think one of the things that I hope we learn is that when you're sick, you stay home. If you're sick, you wear a mask. You know, if you travel, if you're on long distance flights, maybe we should wear a mask because we don't know who else is on the plane that's sick washing our hands, right? The impact that those those habits will have on not just coronavirus, but also other things like influenza, which by the way, this year has completely, the, re, there's reduction in, in mortality from both the flu as well as like uh, just other diseases, you know, cold viruses and other respiratory viruses. It goes to show you washing hands and, and not going to work sick is if we continue at least those parts of good habits, it's gonna have a big impact. Um, on 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 secondary sort of benefits from those diseases as well. So the last question is, you know, how do, will we eradicate this virus or will it become endemic? Well, the concern is that unfortunately there's so much virus that some parts of the world are not going to get the vaccine until 2023, um, you know, or 2022. And the concern is if that's the case, then the transmission is going to continue there and new variants may continue to appear. And that's why it's so important for us to not just vaccinate everybody here, but really everywhere because we are connected. Um, the other thing, because you, I'll put this last slide in there because you are all uh, entrepreneurs and, and economists, um, data shows in the aftermath of most epidemics. So this study was done by International Monetary Fund that showed in five years after a pandemic, generally economic inequality uh, increases, even if your economic productivity and GDP comes, you know, goes up again. And that's what the predictions are that we're already seeing the economy turn around the inequality increases because the people who got sick were people who were poor, who had to work on the front lines, who didn't have protection. They ended up in the hospitals. They couldn't pay their bills. They you know, they went into debt. And so you had this cycle where you're seeing people lose jobs um, and people getting sick. And, and, and what we're gonna have to do as a community um, is just pay attention to that and really sort of um, you know, pay attention to how we rescue those within our community that are suffering in the aftermath of this. So I'll end there just so we can have some time for questions. Um, and here we go. Thanks so much, uh, Nahid. Really appreciated this presentation and this overview, and especially going over some of the myths uh, surrounding uh, vaccination. Um, you know, you also have a background at Fletcher, and you've served in so many state, local, and national government bodies. I wonder if you can speak a little bit about the impact of um, public policy, governance, corruption on uh, containing the epidemic and uh, eliminating it altogether. Yeah, so this was um, it's a huge part of what I do is pandemic preparedness, right? I've done that for almost 15 years at this point. And in the last 10 years, it's, it's focused on the viral hemorrhagic fevers component. Um, we've been, you know, I've been part of a lot of national groups in, in organizing, you know, the technical aspects of how do we get our hospitals ready? How do we get our communities ready? The one thing that none of us expected is how big a role disinformation was going to play. It's, it's played a role in prior pandemics, true, but we're in a different place, right? The internet is a completely different beast than it was even 10 years ago. Um, the amount of disinformation um, is is incredible, you know, and 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 there are myths that are done by groups, organized groups. There are myths that are created by um, just people who are not, you know, not as informed about it. But they're actually, interestingly enough, from a Fletcher perspective, a lot of myths that were spread by state actors. You know, there are tons of Russian trolls. They're actually spreading myths about coronavirus and confusion um, about coronavirus. Um, and and so those are. This is not my opinion. These are proven studies. That so I'll just say that. The other thing that sort of affected this is, um, and you've seen me speak about this, I'm guessing on MSNBC as well, is um, politics within our country. You know, we've been so divided, the left and the right. And at some point, a very early in this pandemic, it became, um, it, it became a left and right issue. And that political divide was a self 
inflicted wound, right? We, we, we could have all taken the right steps and, and closed down and put all the resources in, in place and then opened up actually to a lot more than what we did over the year had we just had the right resources and had we just done it right. And if any everybody had worn a mask, um, it would have made a big impact. And studies show that we could have saved a, a, a lot of lives. 60% of the lives that we lost could have been saved had we just had a united public health front. And unfortunately, the issue here was politics played a big role. And, and you know, I, I, know, I don't see Say this as a partisan politician. I say this as a public health person, where there's evidence now that um, politics, even at the highest levels of, of our government, right, in terms of how we saw this pandemic and how we portrayed it, and, and, and whether it was over, whether we could go back to normal, that confusion early on led to more increased loss of life. And, and I, I hope that when we leave this, one of the things that we do is separate pandemic policy completely as much as we can and prepare and, and really have paths and tools to deal with disinformation in the future. Thank you. I think another issue is about children not having, um, they're not as much of a, a group at risk. And you brought up that there are hospitalizations of children and yes. maybe not as, as much. But when we talk about administering the vaccine, we are talking about we have enough vaccines for the adults, but we aren't vaccinating children, right? That's so. right. So here's the story with children. Um, so children, uh, we know that in the spring and fall and summer, we did not see, there, there were kids getting hospitalized and there were kids, you know, I can tell you, we had kids who had actually pretty severe um, outcomes. You know, they have something called a multi-system inflammatory, uh, inflammatory syndrome in children that it is, comes in the aftermath of coronavirus infection. And, and it's very rare, but it can occur. Um, the, the, the concern has been like, did we not see these big numbers because children are not in schools, right? Where the, because they were not exposed to the virus. It does seem like there, there is a, um, children don't seem to have as much of a symptomatic infection um, and they certainly don't get sick. However, the numbers, you know, in the last February or so, there's been a 6% increase in, in infections in kids. With the new variants, what we know is that um, as, as it is in adults, these new variants can cause higher amounts of virus in the airways of children, which means that if they go to school, they, they could potentially transmit it to other people. Um, there's no evidence yet that it affects the severity in children at all. So there's no evidence that, you know, I, I hope I hope it turns out to be that it does not have any impact in actual disease in children. I think what's gonna be important to return us to schools, the currently there are, the vaccine manufacturers all have pediatric trials. They're likely to report out by the summer, um, which is, which is, which means that all the adults will be vaccinated who's at the highest risk. And if we do that path and to make classrooms safer, ventilation, you know, spacing, continuing the masks, because we're spending a long amount of time with those children who are not vaccinated, I think we can go back to full-time, um, you know, learning sooner rather than later. But, but yeah, it's the kids, the, the vaccines for kids probably will not be available probably until the summer or early fall. But uh, by the way, your college kids will get the vaccines because it's 18 and over. So most college students will have gotten vaccinated before they go back to school next fall. So uh, thank you so much. Um, with with three vac variants already out there from Brazil to South Africa to the UK, I mean, there's a fear that there will always be new variants. Uh, we don't know where they're going to come from. And uh, will the vaccine prevent us from um, you know, will, will they protect us at all from the new variants? And will life ever really return back to normal now that like, you know, this, the Pandora's box has been open? Uh, yeah, great question. And that goes with the whole, you know, a lot of discussion on this because there's a conversation of will we ever be able to eradicate SARS-CoV-2? And so at this point, you're you're venturing into opinion rather than, you know, um, potentially that we don't have the data on that. We don't know. It, Dr. Fauci says that he'd like to see that our grandkids and our kids may not have to deal with this, you know, once they grow up. But it, I think it's unlikely that in, in the next five years or six years that we'll be able to eradicate this from the face of the earth because it's just everywhere. Um, it's in every single corner of the world, um, and it is replicating. And and what we might have to do, at least in the short term, so will we be able to will we be able to eradicate it? Um, I hope so. Uh, but in the short term, I think what we'll need to do is to turn it into a disease like the flu, which you know is there. It comes around every year, but we decrease the severity with vaccines. Um, so new variants may pop up. Uh, currently, of all the variants that we have, they still reduce severe disease. They still review, reduce hospitalization. They still reduce deaths. So that's good news. So would another variant come by next year that could completely undo that? 
yeah, it's possible. I mean, that's why the surveillance is so important and we need to sort of keep an eye on it. The good thing is that we are as, um, this moment today is the most immunologically unprotected we'll ever be because once most of us get vaccinated, we'll have some version of immunity, even if it's, even if it's right, even if it's not as effective, um, some effectiveness probably will be retained with the vaccines we get today against future variants, but we'll likely need to keep getting updated boosters if, if, the, if the virus continues to mutate. I've heard this other myth that if, you know, from people who previously got the coronavirus, that now they are safe, even though we have heard of people being, you know, reinfected, but there's a myth that their body now produces the same benefits that the vaccine produces. Um, so, yeah, well, so there, so the data for natural, I'm just talking about not variants, you know, leave the variants on the side for a second. For natural infection, we know that people uh, with the wild type for at least the first three months, it's pretty unlikely for them to develop any reinfections. And then it might be that it, there's some antibodies that last up to eight months, but the level of antibodies that you create from your natural infection are not the same level as what you get from the vaccines. You know, the vaccines produce an immense amount of large amounts of uh, uh, antibodies, which is what protects them, makes them protective against these variants, because it's the amount of antibodies created that doesn't make the disease, uh, the virus able to sort of overcome it. And so um, the question comes up again and again of like, are people who've been, who've had the disease, should they get the vaccine? My answer would be yes, because you get better protection against the variants, which now seem to cause reinfections. Um, the, 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 there is still sort of discussion because there's new data that shows that you may not need both doses. Um, there's not enough to sort of make a public health decision. But um, if I were to predict what might happen in a couple of months, it's likely that we may have the scenario where um, there might be a public health policy, CDC policies that, that says that people who've had the infection um, could just get one dose immediately right now. But in the future, you may have to do the whole series again. Um, but if you've had the virus, I, 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 you know, I implore you still get the vaccine because I think the, the variants are just increasing in numbers, as I mentioned, across our country. Excellent. Um, the other question that I have is related to your experience in West Africa and Central Africa. Um, when we first heard of Ebola and SARS, they seemed like they were from another country. There was a stigma that this is coming from the outside. Can you talk a little bit about the stigma or any of how this, how the response psychologically has evolved with COVID because we have more deaths than any country in the world now? Yeah. Um, so this is, you know, the this happens all the time, right? I think we tend to associate diseases from the places where they arose, and 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 the trouble is that you know every part of the world is vulnerable to having new diseases. We've changed, you know, as a, as a world. Uh, in my lifespan, the population of the Earth has doubled. We have encroached into these natural reservoirs where animals and viruses are in balance, and all of a sudden we're putting in roads and farmlands, you know, and, and other things, and we're coming in contact with new diseases. And um, and H1N1, you know, by one theory, thought the thought is that they actually have it started here somewhere in the U.S. or somewhere in Mexico. And so the, the every country in the world is, is is vulnerable to emergence of new pathogens. And so it's important for us to not, it doesn't serve any good, right? I mean, I think what, what helps instead is that we help look at ourselves as a global community and help build the infrastructure in all parts of the world to quickly detect new infections so that they don't become a global threat. Thank you so much, Nahid. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. I could keep asking, um, you know, like another hour of questions, uh, but I know that we are going to be moving on to our next panelist, uh, Fazi Khan. I want to give everyone a chance to take a break, uh, stretch, but really thankful for all the great work that you have done uh, before COVID, during COVID. Thank you so much for speaking with us and educating our members. Um, so I hope you'll stay tuned for, for the next presentation with Fazia. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, with that, everyone, um, we're gonna take a break for about 10 minutes. Feel free to go grab a cup of coffee, uh, grab some water, um, and we will have our next speaker, uh, Dr. Fazia Khan, uh, shortly. So stay, so don't go too far away. Don't wander off.